Good morning, and thank you all for coming to our first Lunchtime Visiting Artist presentation. Um, especially thanks to faculty, uh, Martha and Sean, for really spearheading this conversation. Um, I just know it's going to be a really valuable part of our college's archive and the work with the wonderful Lydia. Um, of course, we all know fantastic Lydia Gordon, who's the Associate Curator for Exhibitions and Research at the Peabody Essex Museum, as well as Montserrat faculty. Uh, she earned her BA in Art Administration from Simmons College in 2010, and her dual MA in Art History, Theory, and Criticism, Art Administration, and Policy from the School of the Art Institute in Chicago in 2017. Um, at PIM, Lydia helps organize complex exhibitions and publication projects, including Playtime, a digital ca catalog that accompanied it, and of course, the fantastic Hans Hoffman exhibition last year, which we were so thankful to kind of have a small little part of. Today, she's here to talk about the exhibition she curated entitled Jacob Lawrence, The American Struggle. Yeah. I'll let you take it away, Lydia. Thank you. Thank you, Nathan. And thank you all so much for um, coming to this talk. I miss um, teaching this semester and I miss working with you all. And so I just hope that this lecture can provide some content and um, help. Um, move conversations forward in the classrooms, but also um, across uh, the campus community at large. I will just say there, that truck is still outside my building, so it might, you know, there might be some noise, but here we are teaching and lecturing virtually in 2020, not a surprise here. So um, I'm going to go ahead and um, start to share my screen. Great. Um, so the lecture I'm going to deliver today is entitled Jacob Lawrence, The American Struggle. Um, this lecture focuses on one series of paintings. Sorry, there's the truck. Um, entitled Struggle from the History of the American People by uh, modern American artist Jacob Lawrence. This was an exhibition I helped organize at the Peabody Essex Museum, and it's a nationally touring exhibition currently on view at the Met um, in New York City. So uh, firstly, I'd like to sort of introduce Jacob Lawrence. So here is um, an archival black and white image of Jacob Lawrence in 1958 in front of one of the panels of the struggle series. So this is the moment, this is the crescendo sort of of the presentation of this, um, of this narrative. But um, we're gonna back up a little bit and talk about who Jacob Lawrence was um, and how he came to paint this extraordinary series of paintings. So uh, Jacob Lawrence was born in 1917 in Atlantic City. He moved to Harlem in 1930 with his mom and sister. Um, it's really in Harlem um, at sort of the tales of the Harlem Renaissance that he garners his artistic training. So he's learning um, his artistic practice in the workshops um, in Harlem, which was a community effort by the WPA led by Augusta Savage and Charles Alston. And it's in these workshops that Lawrence develops two things that are pretty important to this series that I'm going to discuss. So firstly, they encourage the students to look around them, to find inspiration in their community, in their family's history, in uh, their neighbor's history, um, in their neighborhood. Um, and so from there, Jacob Lawrence really um, becomes curious about the history of Harlem, the history of his family, and how they came to be in this really vibrant artistic community. He also uh, develops a strategy for telling stories. So Jacob Lawrence is known as sort of a master storyteller um, in, his, in his art. And how he does that is he develops a narrative invention. So he uses um, multiple panels, um, pretty small scale panels typically, to tell a story. And he's interested in the story of Black Americans. So coming out of the Harlem Art Workshops, um, coming out of this schooling in which he uh, develops his understanding of narrative and how to tell this story, at a really young age, um, Lawrence paints what is probably his most famous narrative series called the Migration Series. And the, um, the paintings that you see on the screen are actually just um, images from my cell phone of um, some of the panels of this 60 panel narrative. So in uh, 
1941, Jacob Lawrence decides he wants to tell the story of the Great Migration, of his family's history, of his community's history, of the mass migration of African Americans from the rural South to the industrial Northern cities at the beginning of the 20th century. Um, this mass migration is depicted here across 60 panels. They're pretty small scale. They're about 12 by 16 um, uh, panels and he uses tempera paint. Um, so the images that you see here are several panels uh, throughout the series. And you can also tell sort of how he paints them, how he lays down color. They're pretty visually cohesive. And how he accomplished this in migration series is that he laid down color iteratively. So he laid down all of the browns across all the panels, the yellows, the blues, and the greens. And so when they're installed together, they're, they tell this amazing narrative, but they also visually um, go together and sort of look uh, complete. Um, he painted this when he was 23 years old. And at that time, um, a gallerist who owned downtown gallery, Edith Helper, um, was uh, interested in expanding her roster um, at her gallery downtown. And so she um, published uh, these uh, migration series panels in Fortune magazine. And it's really um, this spread um, in this magazine that skyrockets Lawrence at an incredibly young age to stardom. So because of this publication, two major modern art institutions, the Phillips Collection in DC and the Museum of Modern Art in New York, split the series and purchase uh, 30 panels each. So the Phillips and in DC on the odd number of panels and MoMA owns the even number of panels. And this was huge. Um, I mean, Lawrence really is catapulted into a very highly segregated white art world um, at the age of 20. And he's one of the first black artists to enter the collection of the Museum of Modern Art. And it's really um, this sort of moment that he um, steps on into his like upward trajectory as a major, as a major modern artist. Um, and here are just some um, archival images of um, a really young Lawrence um, showing his work to the uh, Baltimore Museum of Art on the left. And then on the right is a image of young Lawrence with the rest of Edith Helpert's um, artists. And you'll notice, you know, he is the only black artist um, in this downtown gallery. And here's an installation image um, of part of the migration series. And it's, they're actually currently up at the uh, Whitney Museum um, of American Art in New York. Um, so again, from this installation image, you can kind of get the sense of the scale um, and again, how they sort of look like they go together. So from migration series, Lawrence um, also begins to garner some pretty real world experiences. So after migration, um, after he paints migration, he, um, he enters the Navy and it's really in the Navy that he said to have experienced uh, the most democratic society. Um, he is on one of the first integrated troop ships um, and he uh, is tasked um, with being the um, artist on the ground. And so here's an image of, of a young Lawrence um, showing and generating artwork while, his, while he's in the Navy. Um, so he has this international context, this international experience. Um, at this time, he also moves out of Harlem. Um, so he and his wife, the artist uh, Gwendolyn Knight, um, moved to Sudavent Heights in Brooklyn. And um, he begins uh, to also teach at Pratt um, in, in this time period sort of after migration series. So we're sort of moving through the decades here a little bit and sort of building up to this moment where Lawrence is becomes a more mature artist. Um, there are also all these things that are of course happening in the world at mid-century. 
Um, this is the dawn of the modern civil rights movement. Um, and so this image of Dr. Martin Luther King in 1955 um, at the Montgomery, at the first day of the Montgomery bus boycotts, this is the moment in history where, in American history, especially where Lawrence is experiencing this reckoning, um, this, these issues of um, segregated schools. Um, he's also very much an artist, um, sort of, it, it, occupying this insider outsider um, experience because he is collected you know by these major art institutions um, but he's not necessarily getting the same um, accolades as, as his white art, uh, as the other white artists. So um, this is all sort of fodder um, for his, uh, narrative series that I'm going to talk about today, which is entitled Struggle. What's also happening at um, this moment, mid-century in the 1950s, in terms of um, social and political history is that this is, of course, the era of McCarthyism. So um, these, uh, Senator Joseph McCarthy is um, creating these committees um, to investigate on American acts. Um, communism was a really great threat um, to this government and a lot of Jacob Lawrence's colleagues and friends and fellow artists um, went before these, um, these committee hearings. And Lawrence himself lived under FBI surveillance his entire life. Um, so it's really this moment of um, questioning and reckoning that Lawrence um, decides he's going to paint another narrative series. So he paints a total of 10 narratives in his whole life. Um, and this one that I'm going to talk about um, was painted in this environment. So how does Jacob Lawrence respond to um, these moments of uh, the civil rights and McCarthyism and these questioning of larger society is that he goes to the library. So Lawrence is a researcher, he's an artist researcher, and he returns to the 135th Street branch of the New York Public Library, which is of course now the Schomburg Center for Research and Black Culture in Harlem. This library, this branch of the library was um, his childhood library. It's where he went to research all of his narratives, including migration, to find the stories and the texts and the accounts of those that had experienced um, this history. So what Lawrence is looking for in this particular project in the middle of the 1950s is he's interested in American history. He's interested in broadening sort of this uh, framework in which he had um, typically and previously interrogated through through uh, black history, but he's interested in um, in an inclusive history. How did we get to this moment? Who contributed um, and why aren't they prevalent in the dominant narrative? So the archival image that you see um, on the screen is an image from the 1930s. This is um, at the reading room in the library. And what the librarians and archivists are doing is that they are um, cutting out contemporary um, to their time um, articles from newspapers, periodicals, broadsides that relate to black culture, and then they're pasting them in binders. And these became what's known as the clipping files. So Lawrence, as a researcher, as a historian, not only had access to the great collection of books and manuscripts from um, the library, but also these clipping files. Um, again, thinking about what's going on in the world in the 1950s, this became um, extremely important as sort of Lawrence synthesized his project to create this American narrative, this inclusive story of American history. Um, the library, of course, serves as inspiration for Lawrence throughout his career in the painting. The image of the painting on the right is um, is an image of the library um, that he continues to paint long after um, 
this, this particular series. So here's an image of what those clipping files look like. Um, unfortunately, the originals are uh, missing. We don't know where they are, but we have facsimiles, which is great, of these clipping files. So we could go through and sort of see what Lawrence was seeing. Um, these are um, clippings that relate to um, the Boston Massacre and particularly um, Crispus Attucks as it relates to um, the history of Boston and how we educate our students about Crispus Attucks in schools, in the classrooms. Um, so all of these clippings and all of these um, published articles are in tandem with the books that Lawrence is reading in the library. And um, we know what books he um, sourced because he lists them in a plan of project um, in which he used to apply for grant funding. So these are um, the seven books that Lawrence cites in his bibliography. And you'll notice that, um, well, I don't know if you noticed, but just so you know, these are pretty um, sort of standardized history texts. Like these are what would be included in an American history class um, in 1954. Um, so he's 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 looking at the dominant narrative, and then he's also using the material from the Schomburg, and he's doing almost like a cross analysis about what's missing, what isn't there. And this is how, and this is why he decides to paint what he does, but also title the paintings, um, which he does, which I'll talk a little bit about. Um, so this plan of project develops into this proposal, um, this American series proposal. And the words that Lawrence uses to describe this narrative series um, the paintings which I propose to do will depict the struggles of a people to create a nation and their attempt to build a democracy. So what we know from this plan of project and what Lawrence himself hopes for in terms of what this series will depict is that he's using the framework of struggle. He's using um, struggle as a way to investigate all sorts of episodes, all sorts of people, all sorts of contributions to this American cause, right? It's not just a black history. It's not just a history of women. Um, it's a history of everyone. Everyone is in this narrative. Um, and what comes out of it is um, the series entitled Struggle from the History of the American People, uh, 1954 to 1956. So, here is a um, snapshot of all these different panels and, and um, what they look like. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do some deep dives into a couple of them and then talk about their, uh, the resources Lawrence used to generate the image, but also generate the words that went with the image. And I'll also talk about why some of these squares are blank. Um, so the first panel of this series, this is a series of 30 paintings, um, is this image. Um, again, if you, this looks pretty big on your screen, but if you can imagine these are 12 by 16 tempera panels, uh, tempera paint on, on hardboard panels. So what you're looking at is um, sort of two different components of an artwork. You have this painting where we see this um, figure pointing, this sort of galvanizing motion, these folks raising their fists um, in, uh, in this collective effort. You also see there's blood on the wall. You see a woman, um, if I can, I don't know if you, can, oh, here, okay. You see a woman, a woman clutching her child, and then these also these figures in, in shadow here. Um, so, all of these panels are paired with a title caption. So the title caption for panel number one is life so dear, peace so sweet as to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery, Patrick Henry. This is a speech in which Patrick Henry, who was an attorney, he was an orator, 
He delivered a speech at the Virginia Convention in 1775 um, that was trying to rally the colonists against um, the, the Patriot cause, against um, the British oppression, right? This, this cause for independence. Um, most people, if they know the speech, they know the lines, give me liberty or give me death. Um, but Lawrence does not excerpt those lines. He, um, he excerpts this question, this question that centralizes the contradictions of slavery as the beginning of this American history narrative. Um, and then of course he paints this galvanizing motion, this, this scene um, where of course there is always blood. So there's also this violence, this question of what's it going to take to achieve these goals that are laid out um, uh, by Henry and sort of this collective effort um, to, to be free. Um, panel two um, is an example where not every panel has a caption. Um, not every panel is titled using first person accounts. Most of them are, but sometimes, especially in this case, they're titled with the events, the historical events that the paintings depict. So um, Massacre in Boston is um, the title for this one, the Boston Massacre, which we sort of know a lot, especially through another um, visual representation of this scene, um, which is uh, Paul Revere's engraving. So um, Revere's engraving was largely reproduced um, after the event and sort of included as propaganda for um, American um, uh, independence. But Lawrence's painting looks incredibly different. And the clipping files I showed you from the, at the beginning were, um, were in relation to contemporary events related to the Boston Massacre. Um, so what he's doing um, is he is reinserting the central figure um, into this American narrative, um, into the dominant narrative. So um, how he's doing that is he is visually composing um, using uh, elements of design to draw our eye to this central figure down here. And this figure is meant to represent Crispus Attucks, who was the first to die in the conflict and the first to die in the American Revolution. Attucks was a man of African and native descent. Um, he is seen here clutching, dying, um, as his comrades behind him continue uh, to uh, defend um, the, uh, the colonists against uh, the British who were using um, who are using guns and ammunition. So Lawrence also makes a choice not to depict um, the British or those firing. So he's really sort of focusing in on, on those that are um, struggling, right, to, to um, against oppression. And, uh, you know, Revere does not include addicts at all in his engraving. Um, it's sort of whitewashed um, this this figure out of the dominant narrative. And it's not actually until abolition that Attucks gets inserted back into the visual representation um, of this historical moment. So here's an installation image of the first three panels um, at PEM. So you can see again, just in terms of scale, how um, how intimate they really are. Lawrence, as he did for all of his narrative series, he really envisioned this as, as, as work you could hold in your hand, right? He wanted to make this accessible. He wanted folks to feel like they could see themselves in these actions, in these paintings. But I hope you also notice how big the title captions are as they relate to um, the paintings. So we made this choice um, at PEM in that the title captions were a central component because it's really the relationship between the words that are on the wall and largely first person accounts and the relationship uh, with the image. So the two components create the work of art. Um, I'm not going 
in order. I'm not going to talk about all 30, so I'm going to skip around a little bit. But this is panel five, um, and it's also the title of um, our book that we created. So the painting, the image, is this violent uprising um, of uh, enslaved peoples um, uh, rising against their white um, oppressors. And uh, through swords and daggers, um, there are men in chains. Um, there's always blood in these panels. Um, it's this incredibly violent altercation, this violent scene. What's interesting is that Lawrence paints this, but he decides to excerpt um, from, this from this petition. So this petition in which the, the words, we have no property, we have no wives, et cetera, um, is a petition that was submitted by an enslaved man named Felix um, to the Massachusetts Bay um, Colony, um, in which he petitioned his freedom by appealing to um, almost the religious right that we are all children of God um, and we all deserve to be free. Um, this petition, of course, um, and the freedom was denied. Um, but this sort of nonviolent approach to uh, petitioning one's freedom is um, not exactly what Lawrence paints, right? He paints the violence. Um, and so we've done a lot of this sort of reckoning again between the words and the image and thinking about sort of the 1950s and the civil rights movements and these different paths one can take towards um, attaining one's freedom of the violence and the nonviolence, of course, I think is predicated on, on this relationship between uh, the petition Lawrence excerpted and of course the image. So it's not always a one-to-one -one relationship. And here's a, just an image um, of this petition um, that is you know, readily available in the archives and um, in the Massachusetts historical archives um, where we could read Felix's words. The next panel um, is panel six. Um, and Lawrence um, excerpts the last line of the Declaration of Independence. So um, thinking about American history and this and this Declaration of Independence, which is actually a not non-legal binding document, but rather a pledge. Um, that we all have to take on this burden to uphold freedoms for everyone. If if you're not free, I'm not free. If I'm not free, you're not free. And and he pairs this this excerpted line from this pledge with a lone farmer, um, sort of carrying this burden, this wagon load of hay. He set his rifle aside, but of course there's still blood. You know. This fight is not over, even though we declare ourselves um, to move forward to achieve freedom for all, um, the battle is ongoing. So panel 10 um, of this series, which in um, out of the 30 panels, panel 10 um, is in the section where Lawrence is looking at, at the battles. Um, so the first section sort of leading up to the declaration and then the middle section are these battles uh, that uh, American and the Continental Army were fighting against uh, the British who were much more organized, had a lot more resources. Um, it's sort of amazing that we were able to uh, win any of these battles. And so what Lawrence does is he takes, um, he takes a pretty popular historical event um, in, in, uh, the crossing of the Delaware. So this is, um, this is really well known. It's in all the history books that he's looking at, but, um, he paints a really abstracted, um, panel that, um, you know, is so vibrant with color. This blue, um, just totally pops off, off, um, the board here, and he has these huddled figures in these boats 
um, that are so close together here. And they're all carrying, you know, they have their bayonets, so there's lots of points. I mean, um, and he also, of course, still includes, you know, the blood on, um, on the ships. So as these ships are really, they're almost like rocking um, and really struggling, you know, to maintain balance in this body of water. Uh, what Lawrence is doing visually in terms of what he paints is, is emphasizing the collective effort, right? There's no one protagonist in this painting. Um, and of course he pairs it with this uh, first person account from Tench Tillman who was Washington's aide de camp. And in this letter that Tillman pens, he is paying homage to those nameless soldiers um, that took the risk to cross the Delaware um, in freezing conditions in the middle of the night on you know Christmas Eve to surprise the Hessians and Trenton. Um, so again, this relationship between image and text makes us really think about uh, those that have been underrepresented from the dominant narrative of this particular story. And just to do a little compare and contrast, um, both of these paintings are owned by the Met. Um, and Emanuel Leutz's painting of Washington crossing the Delaware is what's mostly reproduced in history books. And it's very clear in Leutz's painting, you know, who Washington is. He's literally bathed in this halo of light, um, leading uh, the soldiers forward here. Um, just also to give you some more perspective on, on, you know, that this is really, Lawrence's history painting is, history painting like you've never seen it before. I mean, the Loitza is huge, right? Most folks I think think of American history paintings as, you know, epically large in these gilded frames, right? Lawrence's narrative um, is composed of intimate panels, you know, but when they're all together, have this incredible impact um, on this story of, of American history. Um, so panel 11 um, is really unique in terms of um, how close Lawrence sort of zooms in on this really intimate individual moment between these two figures. So there's this um, kind of awkward um, whisper exchange um, between these two figures here. You're not quite sure who is like on which side. Um, and then you have this title caption, which is a whole bunch of numbers. Um, and then, uh, you know, from an informer's coded message. So this is a really good example that I tend to use to explain and show and demonstrate how Lawrence used um, his research materials to produce the, um, the title captions, but also the paintings. So because we know, um, the books that Lawrence used, we were, well, pre-COVID, we were able to have them out in the gallery um, at PAM. And so the seven books that you see in the sort of library section were the seven books that Lawrence lists in his bibliography. In one of these books, um, which is titled The Secret History of the American Revolution, it's from the 1940s, um, there is this page um, in which, um, the author is talking about uh, Benedict Arnold and uh, this the sort of story and historical account of um, Arnold's treason. And so what this page shows in the book is a figure of the note, of the handwritten note that Benedict Arnold had in his pocket when he was discovered to be a traitor. And in this note is a numerical, you know, it's a numerical system that um, communicates location. So what he was doing is he was communicating Washington's location to Cornwallis. Um, so Lawrence, we know, you know, saw this page, saw this figure of this note in this book, and he used it to title caption um, the, the title of panel 11. So those one, one, two, zero dot nine dot so on and so forth are, are excerpted actually from the note that Arnold had in his pocket. 
and here's just another installation image of, um, of panel 10, panel 11, and then panel 12, um, the next one, which I'm going to talk about in which Lawrence um, elevates a historical account of women's contribution to the American Revolution. Um, so the next panel is this one. It's entitled, In a Woman, Man's a Canon. Um, Lawrence was very much inspired by not what was in the history books, because there was nothing in the history books about women's contribution to the revolution, um, but about um, this sort of contemporary moment in the 1950s where Molly Corbin's um, remains were discovered and then transported to, to West Point. And Molly Corbin was, um, well, she's depicted as this figure here. Um, and she is, um, she's known for her bravery in the Battle of Fort Washington. Um, she accompanied her husband, who was uh, to man the cannon, one of the cannons, and he was injured and actually killed in action during the battle. And you can actually see his body down here. Um, and she stepped in, stepped into this position and fired the cannon supposedly with great accuracy, but she also drew a lot of enemy fire. Um, and Corbin, you know, was uh, celebrated for her heroism in the moment, but for the rest of her life really struggled because uh, we didn't have uh, um, processes or um, support for female veterans. Um, and so she actually lived the rest of her life sort of in destitute trying to, um, because she was physically hurt, um, trying to uh, achieve any sort of pension that her male um, veteran counterparts uh, was granted by the government. So here's a, um, a contemporary, you know, article that was published in the New York Times um, that Lawrence would have seen about um, about this tribute to this female um, veteran, this heroine of the revolution, and sort of get these um, get sort of inspired by the story in which he inserts, you know, her story in the larger American history narrative. Uh, panel 13 is, is a panel that sort of ends this, this first battle section. It's called Victory and Defeat. Um, it marks the surrender at Yorktown, which um, is interesting because this, um, this moment uh, occurs after a, the siege, a 22-day siege, um, in which uh, the Continental Army successfully defeats the um, British Army. And ceremoniously, the, um, the uh, generals are supposed to uh, surrender their swords to one another, sort of this symbolic moment um, that the battle is over. So what Lawrence does is he paints um, you know, the receiving hand um, of America and uh, the um, extended arm of the British, but they're still holding on to this sword, right? Whoops. And um, this pause, you know, between the hands is pretty pregnant. It's almost like this isn't quite over yet. Um, and it's not. <laughs> That's why we have um, 15 more panels um, of this series. So there are two peace panels in the struggle series. Um, this is the first one. Um, and again, they sort of like bookend um, these battle scenes. The reason that this image is in black and white is because we don't know where this painting is. Um, this image is from a, the last time this painting was reproduced. Um, it was reproduced in a in a book in the 1960s. Um, so we don't actually know, you know, what color um, it was, what the sky looked like, what the flowers looked like. Um, and the reason um, that we don't know what it looks like is because the Struggle series is the only narrative series by Jacob Lawrence that was dispersed. So the image that you see here on the screen is um, 
excerpted from an agreement that his gallerist, Charles, Alst uh, um, Charles Allen, um, brokered with the collector. Um, I hope you've seen or sort of picked up on just how complex this American history narrative is. Um, Allen tried his best to sell it to the major museums that had fostered Lawrence's career, but um, quite frankly, they weren't ready. They weren't ready for um, an inclusive representation of American history. And so he struggled to sell it um, and he sold it finally after several years of mounting the panels twice. Um, and so in this deal, which was made with William Myers, who was a collector um, in Long Island, what was left out of this agreement was that um, William Myers had the opportunity to resell the paintings individually. And that's exactly what he did. So between um, 1958 and, um, and the end of the century, um, he sold individual paintings uh, to institutions, to private collectors. And so this project, um, this struggle series project, it's really a reunion. It's a way to, to recapitulate, you know, the lost narrative series of Jacob Lawrence. So that's why we don't know where some of them are. Um, panel 18 um, is just a really wonderful example of um, Lawrence as a, like a master colorist. Um, this is part of the series that begins to look at um, America trying to figure out its position um, both internally and externally uh, on an international stage, on a world stage. Panel 18 um, is representing the historical event of um, the Corpse of Discovery. So um, Sacagawea here leading um, Lewis and Clark um, across um, to the west, uh, in particular this moment across the Bitterroot Mountains of Montana. And what is being, uh, what Lawrence paints in this, in this painting is Sacagawea uh, negotiating their pass through the Shoshone people's lands of Montana. So what she's doing is she's negotiating with uh, their chief, Kakamawit here. Um, and what's happening in this um, moment of negotiation and conversation is that they begin to recognize each other and realize that they're actually talking to their sibling. So Sacagawea and Kikamowit had been long separated since childhood. Um, Sacagawea was previously enslaved. And so this moment is like a tender reunion of family um, and this is the moment that Lawrence emphasizes, right? He doesn't emphasize, you know, Lewis and Clark, even though they're sort of pictured here, but he paints the sibling reunion. And what's also amazing is just how Lawrence uses the color to emphasize symbolically this love. Um, if you'll notice, you know, how he uses the reds um, and then the blues, they sort of create this heart shape in the middle of the painting. Um, and then Lawrence excerpts this letter uh, that Thomas Jefferson wrote to Lewis and Clark about how to, of course, conduct themselves on this journey, uh, which we know foreshadows the ongoing struggles of uh, Native American peoples to attain any sort of freedom in, uh, in America, uh, the land that they have been on for millennia. And here's just um, an installation image of this panel. I'm probably not supposed to have favorites, but I do, and this is it. So that's why I just wanted you to see um, just how gorgeous this panel really is. Um, panel 19 uh, begins to, Lawrence is beginning to look at what's largely considered the second great battle of American independence which is uh, the Battle of 1812. So these are battles in the 19th century that are um, trying to establish 
America on an international stage, but uh, uh, Britain is oppressing um, the uh, trade between America and all these other different European um, and uh, world countries by impressing soldiers. So what they're doing is they're capturing American um, uh, American Navy soldiers and forcing them to serve on British ships for um, for Britain. And um, what Lawrence paints here are these soldiers, um, their heads hung low in front of um, a British colonel, but of course they're bound, right? They're in they're in bondage. They're uh, wrapped up. Um, the the um, words here, that title caption are from uh, Madison when he went before um, the uh, government and said that this was the gravest mistake. Um, this is the gravest threat to, to America, to the United States. Um, uh, and we need to do something to protect our American um, soldiers. Um, the uh, the sort of panel that ends these 1812 battles is um, the Battle of New Orleans, which is seen in this painting. This was um, an incredibly bloody um, with a really high death toll um, battle in which um, the Americans, which I will say, um, the Battle of New Orleans was fought um, with um, with a diverse group of combatants. Um, Jackson's army were comprised of Creoles, Kentuckians, enslaved peoples, uh, uh, free men um, fighting against this cause, this American cause. Um, and what they did is they dug sort of a trench along the Mississippi, put up their bayonets, and then the British just fell on them. So what is being depicted in this painting is the soldiers looking down sort of at the massacre that lay below them. And then Lawrence excerpts Jackson's um, recollection of, of the battle um, in which um, he's sort of giving credit to um, the collective effort of his army, but it was full of carnage. Um, the Battle of New Orleans, which is unfortunate because um, the panel that follows the Battle of New Orleans is another peace panel. And this is, um, this panel marks the historical event of the signing of the Treaty of Ghent. And this was a treaty that was signed between British and American forces in Belgium um, that officially ended the impressment and ended the War of 1812, these maritime battles. And unfortunately, the treaty was signed before Jackson and his army went into battle, but the news of the treaty had not gotten back yet. So all of those lives lost in vain. Um, the panel here is of nature. So again, these sort of feeble flowers trying to grow um, from the scorched earth. Um, and they're, they're fragile, right? Like America's trying to regrow again. But of course we cannot forget that we have um, that slavery is still uh, legal, if not proliferating in the South due to the cotton gin. So at the same time that America is trying to establish itself in, in an international platform, we are still um, we are still enslaving people, and we are still um, live you know existing in this contradiction of freedom. And so um, Lawrence continues to remind us you know, of these, of these histories. So um, the really gruesome sort of violent image here of um, the enslaved and wounded um, men struggling against their uh, white captives and struggling for control of these weapons. The title caption that goes with this painting is um, excerpted from a correspondence between two enslaved 
peoples in Georgia and North Carolina that were planning a slave revolt. So what's also missing in the dominant history of American history, of course, is are the, the large amount of slave revolts that were um, organized um, in the 19th century. And so um, this revolt was, um, actually suppressed because the correspondence was found um, and published in the newspaper. So it, it, this one didn't happen, but Lawrence uses that in the power to actually image the violence and the revolt and what it takes to attain freedom for all. Um, the last panel of this series um, is this one. It is um, looking west. I'm um, again thinking about America trying to figure out, you know, its uh, its position internally. Um, and so you have these oxen that are pushing these wagons and they're um, snorting and struggling um, with this load. But of course, there's always blood. So um, it's almost like a symbol that, you know, this work is not over. There's much more battles and much more um, struggle to endure to, again, live up to these um, these burdens, but to, um, to also make sure that we are all um, moving America as a project forward. So again, just looking at what Lawrence himself um, hoped to achieve with this narrative series is that these would enlighten, these would bring forward the struggles of people that are underrepresented um, and that, you know, the American people, um, are, are all contributing to this cause and to really create a complex and inclusive understanding of America um, and, the, and American voices and all those that contribute to the cause. Um, I know there was some interest in talking about how this show like was curated. Um, and so I'm going to quickly just sort of touch upon that. Um, so we had this note to the visitor that um, once they entered the exhibition, it talked about why sort of the, some panels are missing. There are five panels that are missing. Um, we don't know where they are and they were represented in the gallery space with any information that we did know about them. So like that black and white image was on the wall. Um, all the reproductions of the of works that were not original were unframed. Um, and there were cues in the in the labels, um, whether it was an original or not original. And we made this choice at PAM to try to be transparent about where we were in this process of trying to find the missing panels. So here's an image of the last panels from this series, and they're all reproductions. Um, but they all have sort of like different situations of why they're reproductions. And so again, um, this panel here, which is black and white, we don't know where it is. We are using the last time it was reproduced, so that's why it's black and white. The Erie Canal painting, we don't know where it is, but we do know what colors um, Lawrence used because it was reproduced in a color photograph. And then panel 30, which I talked about um, ending this series, we do know where it is. Stanford um, University owns it, but unfortunately it has major condition issues and can't travel. So there's all these different layers and complexities that would go into what we choose to present and what makes what would make the most sense you know, to the visitor. Um, this is an installation image of the paintings at the Met. Um, so again, as a curator, you always sort of want other venues to add their own spin to it, to create more meaning um, and to, to really use it as an opportunity to reach their audiences. So the, these are the last you know, three paintings um, of the Struggle series and they decided to use um, this black and white graphic on the wall as a way to communicate what was um, not original, no matter what the sort of situ situation was. Um, so it's sort of like, you know, we know that it's missing here. Um, and again, it's, you know, just sort of a different take. Um, all of this content, all this research, um, it, what happens is that you end up um, trying to gather all of these voices um, first for the book and then for the um, exhibition. So what we did when we were 
organizing the book is that we wanted to ask other people what they thought. What did they see in these paintings? Um, and so we asked a ton of artists and scholars um, and you know other folks that were that were sort of on our radar that added more meaning than you know the curators could. And so this is an example of one of the pages in the publication where we ask an outside contributor to tell us what they see in these paintings, and then the curatorial contribution to these paintings uh, talks about the historical event. So in this particular in instance. Um, artist and educator Steve Locke is talking about panel one and he talks about it in relationship to the Oath of the Harati. And um, again, all of this content adds fodder for what ends up being, you know, the label in the exhibition. Um, we also produced a book where teenagers uh, responded to the panel. So this exhibition is traveling nationally and we asked um, the, the venues, the other museums to connect us with um, teenagers that were part of their programs to look at these panels and um, tell us what they think, what they felt, how it related to their own experience. Um, and so we were able to publish um, a teen book, um, a young adult book um, on the struggle, which again is really wonderful because it just continues to, to make meaning. And then um, I had also curated contemporary artists in PEM's presentation of the struggle series. Um, and three other venues are also including these contemporary artists. And that's a decision that we made to, to really emphasize how history is not a distant period of the past, but an active space that's um, really questioned in the present. And so each of these artists really look at one particular sort of conceptual pillar of the struggle series um, and how they turn history into art. So Bethany Collins is looking at the history of words and how language shifts over time. Hank Willis Thomas is looking at the visual archive of American history. And then Derek Adams is looking at uh, the history of place through time. And so again, it's all about you know, making more meaning, adding more interpretation, more voices to contribute to um, a series of paintings by Jacob Lawrence that really demands this inclusive approach. Um, so that's it for me. I just wanna say thank you. This is just an image of um, you know, a previous sort of work session I've had with students and connecting um, with colleges and classrooms. This is an amazing opportunity to continue to spread um, Jacob Lawrence. And I'm just really grateful for um, your participation. So thank you. Thanks so much, Lydia. That was amazing. <laughs> that was good. thank you. And it's truly more than we could have hoped for or asked for. That's just so incredible, so well researched and in depth. Thank you. Thank you very much. I know that we're kind Thank of coming so up much. on top. Like Does anyone have any questions or anything for Lydia or about the exhibition? Just I want to say how grateful I am. I brought a class there last spring, and it's just it's I I actually really appreciate the um the way that you put the text and the images together. And it looks like make that same decision at the Met. Um, congratulations, it's a fabulous show. Thank you, yeah. thank you. Um, I, I can ask a question because the the one with the uh, the Boston massacre with the um, the fact that the one the people at the front line were I don't know if they were formally enslaved or they were. They were part. Do you know anything about the? Yeah. So um, Crispus Attucks um, was um, enslaved in Springfield, Massachusetts. Um, his um, mother was um, of native descent, and her community is escaping me right now. Um, but he was able to purchase his freedom because he was in um, Massachusetts. And so we moved to Natick and then to um, Boston and he worked as a ship hand um, on, um, you know, in, in the yard. And, you know, as we've seen it now, I mean, a lot of the 
um, the Boston massacre was because of economic duress, right? Like the, the, the colonists that were working were not getting paid um, for, you know, proper wages for their labor. Um, and so, you know, this sort of motley crew of, of colonists um, started rioting against the soldiers that were um, on what was King Street, um, which is, of course, now State Street. Um, so, so, yeah, I mean, you know, there are so many accounts um, in the books, you know, of of addicts, but I think it's why content was chosen to be reproduced over and over and over again, really communicated a dominant narrative that um, is not inclusive. And so Lawrence, you know, he did so much research, over five years of research in the library before he even picked up a paintbrush, you know? Um, so yeah, the power of inserting those figures back, I think is, is pretty, it's a remarkable and political gesture. I'm, I'm really interested in one of the points you made early on, which is the relationship to history painting and just the, you know, the, the kind of double activity that's going on here. One, getting away from the conceit that you can tell an entire story in a single panel. And so the multi-panel approach, but then also the role of the text. And that, that is really striking. So I, I was interested in your decision to make the text so large and to, to think about that as, as such an important part of the narrative. I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about your, your thought process there. Sure, yeah, you know, it's really interesting um, because the Met actually decided to put all the title captions just on the wall label, so they're smaller. Um, which, you know, as long as they're there, like that was sort of the curatorial, like as long as the captions are there, because the struggle panels, even though they were they were sort of sold off individually, they have appeared in larger like Lawrence retrospectives, but not all together. Like there were like three panels here and four panels here or whatever, but the text was always severed from the painting. And I don't think um, you can't really understand like the meaning or the multiple meaning without that relationship, without knowing, you know, what account or whose words. I mean, these are first person accounts, um, which was strikingly different for Lawrence because he ex he always wrote the captions for the other narratives in third person. So they were really important, you know, to the artist that these were a secondary component to the work of art. And so we made the decision to give them equal weight, you know, physically like on the wall so that, um, you know, folks would sort of look at the words and they were big enough um, to have a relationship with the painting. Um, and again, I think that was just to, you know, emphasize Lawrence as a, as a researcher and really taking the time to dig through and find those um, find those, you know, words and actions of those that had, you know, been left out. I think the Met took a totally different approach, which is great, but they were really, you know, they were focused on the visual. They were focused on having sort of the narrative sweep in a contained gallery. And at PAM, we don't have, like, we don't have the space in terms of like a design. So um, we weren't able to necessarily have them all like wrap around one gallery, which the Met did. Um, it does have, um, so that was sort of their emphasis, but I think, um, you know, having those words up on the wall, um, you know, Lawrence was really, he wanted the words and the images to be together. Um, and we just hope that it inspired folks to like dig a little bit deeper into these, into these, you know, personal accounts that maybe they've heard of, you know, maybe folks have heard of Patrick Henry, but maybe not necessarily know that line from that particular um, speech, so. And it also seemed like the contemporary artists that you chose were very engaged with the notion of research in their own contributions. Oh, absolutely. I mean, all of them are really looking at how 
uh, to turn history into art, you know, using more sort of contemporary artistic solutions like installation or video and, and that. I mean, it was important to us that Lawrence was the only painter, right? He's like the master painter, center stage in the gallery. Um, but all of the artists are interested in um, mining the archive you know, that's where the work comes out of. And that's where the work came out of for Lawrence too. So it was important to have the archive, not only like physically represented in the gallery space, but like on the walls too, you know, and 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 also emphasize just how important like facts are <laughs> and how important libraries are and archives and research, you know? And so, um, yes, yes, I love that question. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hi, Lydia. Hi. <laughs> I, I had to duck off briefly, um, but I've been listening uh, behind Brian's back uh, for the rest of the time. Um, I, thank you for this amazing exhibition and the presentation today. I, I really love the point that you made, well, the, the observation that um, is brought by the absence of the paintings that aren't there and the conditions under which it was collected because you know, you said the museums weren't ready, right? They weren't ready yet. And it strikes me that um, it's like the mid 1960s where the, the historian Jesse Lemlish comes up with this term, uh, history from the bottom up. And it always, even going back to the migration series, it's just always moved me so much that um, Lawrence was doing that way before, you know, the, histor the historical, uh, field was even engaging in that, you know, and he was really like devoted to recovering this history of the common people, right? And um, it's so timely, I mean, was it last week that Trump, you know, declared we were gonna like uh, ban Hispanic history? You know, the, this battle over how we tell our history is ongoing. <laughs> and, um, you know, so it, it's just become even more timely as this year has gone on. And I really just appreciate the show so much and, and your talk today. Thanks. Oh, thank you. That's so wonderful. Um, I totally agree. Like, as I was sort of saying with uh, Martha's question, like there's just so much power in the facts, you know, and there's so much power in research. And I think Lawrence really understood that from a very young age that, um, you know, everything we need to know uh, can be found and we just need to do the work, right? Like how many works of modern art start in the library? I don't know the answer to that question, but you know, I probably not a lot. Um, and he just took such a different approach to, um, you know, creating something that was honestly, I think meant for viewers like way beyond the 1950s. And I think that's also what makes it like such a great work of art is that it is timeless, right? Like we can all still learn something um, from him. So yes, I agree. Cool, well, thank you so much, Lydia. Thank all of y'all for being here. Um, we're gonna get this edited up, put on YouTube and I can't wait for your class's uh, reaction to all this information as well. Thank you. Thank you all so much. It's so nice to see you all. <laughs> Bye.